Here now is Faith to Live By with Pastor Barber. I am Pastor Barber and this is Faith to Live By, Canada's Church Without Walls. Here our only message is of Jesus Christ and the glory of his saving cross. Everyone, of course, is welcome, and that means you, my friend. Thanks for being here today. One viewer asks if the Bible warm warning of tribulation is only for the Jewish people. We'll get to that shortly on the Bible as the answer. But right now, here's the male quartet. First of all, a shout of triumph, and then an important question for you.
now the Bible has the answer. The questions are yours. This gives me an opportunity to respond to you. And thank you for these good questions we're using today. Question number one, does Genesis 47:21 support slavery in any way? The passage you quote is simply a historical footnote telling us how Pharaoh obtained all the lands of Egypt and how all the people of Egypt became his slaves. Does that justify slavery in any way? No, of course not. It's just the record of an historic fact from way back hundreds of years ago. The word for any Christian is given in 1 Corinthians 7, 23, which says, you are bought with a price, therefore be not the servants of men. God created every one of us so that we would be accountable for our own actions. And the Bible says, Romans 12, 14, that every one of us will give account to God. Slavery runs contrary to that, of course, and is fundamentally wrong. Now question number two, is the radio pastor in the United States correct when he says that the tribulation is only for the Jewish people, for Israel? Answer, no, he is wrong. The book of Revelation plainly states that one-third of the vegetation and water and animal life on this earth will be destroyed according to Revelation 8, 7 to 13. And then we read that uh, Revelation uh, 9, verse 18 says that a third of mankind will die during that awful period of, of tribulation. And we read that uh, all that are on the earth, uh, in the earth, apart from saved people, of course, will worship the Antichrist. No, the tribulation of Matthew 24, 24, and described in the central chapters of the book of Revelation, that tribulation has to do with all that dwell upon the earth. And I'm quoting now from the word of God. Let's get to question number three now. Will God forgive a person who is guilty of abuse? Good question. Answer, God will forgive every sin, according to Matthew chapter 12. Every sin and transgression shall be forgiven except for one sin, the unpardonable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now it's amazing to you and amazing to me, of course, that God forgives every sin that is repented of, every sin that is confessed to him. If we acknowledge our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's hard for you and me to wrap our minds around the ugly sin of abuse, where a man will chain a woman to a bed for days and weeks on end and abuse her continually. That is such a horrible, horrible sin that it seems to me it simply calls for divine justice. But God in his great mercy, well, he, he's anxious to forgive. And whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The only sin that cannot be forgiven is the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And that means that the Holy Spirit ceases to strive with you and you cannot repent. Thank you so much for these good questions. I trust the answers have been a blessing. 
If you have a question you'd like me to use on the Bible as the answer, please write it out, send it to me. I'll be delighted to hear from you. I'll get to your question on the air just as quickly as I can. And when you write, all the address you need is simply faith to live by. Box 426 Winnipeg, and the code is R3C2H6. Let's listen now to the Sturby brothers, Tim and Terry, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. letter asking us the price of the CDs that we offer on the air and of the booklets that we offer to you. And so it's important, I guess, that I say once more that nothing is sold on Faith to Live By. Everything we send to you is simply our way of saying thanks for your involvement in this ministry that God is blessing so richly. I've been talking to you recently about Tim's new CD, 18 numbers that will thrill your heart and be a blessing in your home and help you to witness to your neighbor. If you haven't asked yet for Tim's new CD, please ask for it this week. We'd be glad to send it to you. Also, we've re reprinted this series of television talks on the parables of the Lord Jesus. It's in booklet form. A certain man had two sons. And you, if you haven't received it yet, will want to ask for that as well when you write. 
your involvement in Cal in Faith to Live By is so tremendously important. We thank God for you. You pray for us. You help us pay the costs of airtime. And uh, we're just so grateful for you and for God's rich blessing. May I remind you of our address, because you'll want to write this week, Simply Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba. And the code is R3C2H6. The women's trio now helps you to pray as they sing Jesus I Come. And then Pastor Jim will bring the second in a series of pre-Easter messages that lead up to the cross of Christ. for his ascension, Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem. So we read in Luke chapter 9 and verse 51, and we are going up to Jerusalem even as Jesus did, and we are following in his footsteps and those footsteps of his disciples. And we come to Luke chapter 13 and verse 22 now, and we find that Luke is reminding us of that resolve 
and of that focal point that Jesus had as he moves toward Jerusalem, knowing that the time is short and knowing that there he would give his life a ransom for many and that it would be there that he would be spit upon and mocked and that he would bear upon himself the sins of you and me and that he would be that atoning sacrifice that had long been looked for by the Jews and by all of us. We come to Luke chapter 13, and once again, Luke points out to us that the movement is to Jerusalem. And here in Luke chapter 13 and verse 22, we read, and he was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. And then at the very end of that 13th chapter of Luke, we read of Jesus saying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Here, like bookends, Jesus has Jerusalem in his mind and in his thoughts, but in between this two collection of bookends, as I put it, we have Jesus asked a question, and someone at this very point, as Jesus is once again moving to Jerusalem, and as Luke reminds us of this movement, someone says, Lord... Are there just a few who are being saved? And Jesus takes this as the opportunity to explain something of vital importance, and he speaks of a small and narrow door. John Bunyan, in Pilgrim's Progress, he talks of that small wicket gate through which Christian, the pilgrim, as he was making his way towards the celestial city, would go. John Bunyan, in that account, he would speak of others who would climb over the wall and Christian would say to them, did you not come in by the small narrow door? And they said, oh no, we can, we can jump the wall, we can come in some other way. And we would find that they would throw their faith overboard very quickly. That small narrow door of vital importance as the starting point for anyone who would see the celestial city, who would see heaven on a head. Jesus is described by the Apostle John in John's Gospel, I am the door. I am the door. Jesus is the one. Now when we talk about a narrow door or a narrow passage, many times I have helped someone move into an apartment or something of that kind, and sometimes the doors are small or the passageway is narrow, and sometimes certain furniture does not go in through that door or through a hallway, and it needs to be set aside. Well, here is a vitally important principle for us in a spiritual manner, as Jesus talks about not a wide door or a wide highway, but he talks about that narrow door, he's pointing out that there are some things that do not fit. There are some things that need to be set aside as we press on our way towards heaven, that there is this need. Jesus says, strive to enter through the narrow door, for I tell you, some will seek to enter and will not be able. Many, in fact, will seek to enter and not be able. He talks about the head of the house who gets up and shuts the door and others on the outside, they start beckoning and calling. They say, open up to us the door. And from inside, the head of the house says, I do not know where you are from. And they will give their explanations, their rationale for why the door should be open to them. We ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. And verse 27, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers. And he talks about weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
Jesus knew that the time was short and that he needed to be very direct with these people. And here he was speaking to Jews. He was speaking to those who considered themselves on the inside of God's blessing and of God's grace. Jesus speaks very directly and here he would speak very directly to us as well and he would say, oh, look for that small narrow door Look for the way of the cross. Look for that way that I am for you. Jesus would say there would be some coming from the east and the west, the north and the south. They will recline in the kingdom of God. Some who are last will be first and some who are first will be last. Oh, dear friend, I would point you to that narrow, that small door. I would point you to Jesus Christ himself. Now, Jesus, perhaps you might say, oh, he is often described as so loving and kind, but here, here there are stern words. Here in these stern words, these words that might smack you in the face, that might strike you and that you might, you might think of as a rebuff. Here in these words, words of love you see sometimes when a stern word is spoken when there is it would seem to be a rebuff or a rebuke or even an insult that is something that needs to be said and here jesus is coming and he is speaking these words to people they are asking how is it that we might be saved and Jesus, he comes and he doesn't speak light and nice words. Oh, you know, be nice to your neighbor and, and go to church and do this or do that. Give to charity. He comes to the very heart of the problem. For this is why Jesus came into this world to address the real problem, not an imaginary problem, but to address the real problem. And he comes, he comes to give his life to, ver to give his very blood a ransom. And so he speaks directly. Would you hear these words? And would you receive them? And would you act upon them? Oh, dear friend, come to the cross. Come to the Savior. Come to that small, narrow door. And come and confess your sin. And call upon his name. And know in him life everlasting and eternal. Thank you.